Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Well, William, welcome back to the podcast. It's just great to have you. Good to be here, my friend. We have talked a lot this year, back and forth, texting, big green egg stuff, all that. But you've done the reverse of what most people did. You look like you dropped a few pounds uh, during (laughs) COVID. So tell us about that. Was this a journey to health for you or like what happened? Not well, that you needed to. Not that you needed to, William. But well, no, you look super I probably fit. did. I probably did need to. I've always liked uh, working out, and that's been good. But you know, Carrie, you, you get into this job where uh, I started this twelve years ago now, twelve and a half, something yeah. like that. And wow, I'm going to Memphis. I've never been to Memphis. I've got to go to the place with the good ribs. Wow, I'm in, you know, Baltimore. They have cra- crabs here. I need to go make sure I have a plate of that. And like, you know, I gained a ton of weight the very first year out of the gate. And I always work out and try and be pretty careful. But but uh, when this COVID thing happened, uh, Adrian and I just looked at each other and we were like, this is going to go one way or the other. Mm. And it, we're either going to gain the 19 or lose it. And uh, I think combination of not traveling and she cooks really clean and and doing a little more working out, you know, I, I, I did hit one of those round number birthdays last year that probably kicked me in my butt a little bit and um, made me think, you know. Random trivia, you know, well-researched on the internet as all things are these days. But apparently, if you look at people who run marathons, people whose birth um, year, like their age ends in nine, are overrepresented. In other words, at yeah. 39, it's like, okay, well, I'm in my 30s. I'm going to run this triathlon or this marathon or whatever. And uh, I thought that was interesting. So, of course, you turned well, 30 last year. Is, part of that is because at the uh, round year, uh, so I turned 50, mm-hmm. and I should have gotten in shape at 49 because your your time you run when you're 49 can count toward qualifying for Boston at the 50 age group. Oh. And, uh, so you, you you get to count the times for qualifying, but uh, I didn't do that. So I'm I'm just uh, oh, there. You go. I hit it. like I didn't lose weight, but I didn't gain weight. So I figured that that was good. And then I hit some personal bests on Strava this year, so that was fun. That's More great. personal bests this year than in the last five years combined. So. I tell you, what, weight aside, I have uh, started to live out one of our. Uh, core values a little bit more. This w- one of our values at our company is ever increasing agility, mm. and I, I have said for years. The example is, um, you know, when I was early forties, I was running, and I, I finally needed to start stretching, and oh, so yeah. I'm it sitting. Stinks, by- but it's true. Oh, it's terrible. And and the stretching was more painful and I sweat more during that than the run. And I remember trying to touch my toes one day and our youngest, Macy, was probably two or three at the time. She walked into the room and uh, she saw me just sweating, trying to touch my toes. And she just kind of sized me up, up and down, came beside me. And as only a toddler can do, tied herself in this human pretzel, you know, because the and and then stood up and looked at me again and laughed at me and left the room. Not one word said. And and it dawned on me, uh, this isn't in our question list, sorry, but it dawned uh, on me on that day, hey, William, every day I'm alive, I get less flexible. Yep. Biological fact. It's a company fact. It's a church fact. It's just... So I've said that and stretched some and all that. But back in January before COVID, I um, officially retired from the sport of banana boating. Uh, we, were, <laughs> we were on a lake in a warm climate with some friends on a banana boat. And I was getting off and a wave came in and pulled the boat up. And my leg went one way and I pulled my hamstring. And it, it's the first time I've been injured where I couldn't, like, I, I couldn't fix it. So wow. I've been doing uh, a lot of stretching and trying to do a little bit of yoga here and there. And and that's not something that's helped with weight, but man, do I feel better being more flexible. Isn't that great? Yeah. I, I finally got into stretching a few years ago and uh, 
not serious, but like, oh, on the days I do it, I feel a lot better. Uh, speaking of what is it? Ever increasing agility is one of your company yep. values. So yep. you and I were talking before we started recording. I mean, I've had to pivot. You've had to pivot. Everybody has done this. But what's that meant for Vanderbloom and Associates? Like for your company, what does that mean yeah. when, because you did rely a lot of in-person, in-person searches, meetings, flying around the country, you and your whole team. So how did, how did that hit you and what did you do? Yeah. Well, I mean, God is so good. He, yeah. he sees ahead, right? Mm. And uh, we had been... Finally, so I'm a horrible manager. I mean, I'm really bad. The way the onboarding model when we were a younger company and fewer people, oh, here's how you learn how to do search. Follow William around for six months. Like that was it. Osmosis, I, right? Osmosis model of leadership. Have, yeah. So now I've got people that are smart enough that they built systems and strategies. And I guess the way you're supposed to say it is our, the way we do things can be taught and doesn't have to be caught. Right. 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 So that's a beautiful spot. So all the way back, beginning of 18, we started putting in motion a plan to decentralize our offices, not not totally virtual, but to say, all right, let's start setting up regional offices in areas of the country and the world where we do most of our work. Mm. So we start doing that. We start looking for a different and, and we start setting up. All right. That means we're going to have to get used to doing a lot of virtual. We've done Zoom forever, but let's get really good at it. Let's build backdrops so that no matter where you are, it's going to look the same. And so we had all these virtual backdrops and we had Zoom cameras and we were all ready to go. And then when COVID hit, it was like, wow, we thought we were doing this for one reason. And God was preparing us for another. And we pretty much just flipped the switch and, uh, you know, went virtual during the lockdown period, uh, I guess from March. I guess we came back to the office in late July. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, we can go back to, if we had to go back to totally virtual, we could. And, and you know, the way the numbers as we're recording now are going, maybe that's something that'll have to happen, but that doesn't really scare us. I, I, I think on a business front, uh, one real outcome of the word of the COVID incident is, Pivot is now a four-letter word at our office. We're so tired of hearing that word. Like, oh, give me a break. Can we find another word? Um, but uh, in seriousness, though, um, I don't know that we relied on in-person worship, um, but we did rely on people hiring. And, you know, most churches are doing pretty well, despite what mm. most churches that use us, despite what a lot of press would say, there's a lot more good news than bad. But people hunkered down, like, how's this going to go? What are we going to do? We're not really going to hire. I'm not really going to move right now. And it just kind of went into shutdown. And we knew that. And I, I, you and I have talked, we read that article that uh, was just not really a great bedtime story that Andy Crouch wrote, you know, mm. leading on the Ice blizzard. Age, yeah. Oh, Winter my gosh. Blizzard, yeah. yeah. I read it right before bed. That was bad. I mean, <laughs> so you didn't sleep well that night. Yeah. No, not at all. But 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 we did adopt the okay, this is gonna be a while. So, you know, we shored up cash, we took advantage of PPP uh, loans the government was making. And then we said, How can we we're not gonna be doing a search for a little bit, so how can we serve churches? Right. So that, you know, on the doomsday side, if we die, we die serving, right? And if we pull through this, then we will have served churches and done the right thing during a hard time. Mm -hmm. And and God will smile on that. And uh, so we we pivoted into helping churches with their PPP loans. We helped yeah. with a number of how do you get virtual? How do you reopen? We started enormous leadership uh, content initiatives that, that went forward with schools, with nonprofits, with churches, and uh, spent the summer doing that. And, and, you know, our January and our February were our best January and February ever in mm. terms of new uh, clients or searches or chances to serve. And then March was like off <laughs> March of March of 2020. I shouldn't say this out loud. Mm. Uh, March of 2020 was 96% worse than March of 2019. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty bad. That's so, bad. Yep. That's like if that's you a bad a month. Then you're not sleeping. Yeah. 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 If, you, if you brought in a hundred dollars, then the next March you brought in four. So huh? you know a little bit different. Uh, so and and we were you know we we don't have any debt. We don't have any investors. We've 
you know, kept powder dry. So that's fine. You know, this is why you have a rainy day account. But but we've been excited to see really since the summer, even with very slow and modest reopening of churches and schools, uh, we're, we're seeing real traction and we're now seeing, you know, better a better 2020 right now than we had this time 2019. So I, I very thankful for our team that has pitched in. Uh, we all did something, you know, right out of the gate. We had to restructure and all of our lead team said, okay, we'll take salary cut. I said, no more pay for me for the year. Let's just do what we have to, to, to pull through. And they've really done a great job. And, uh, I, I'm on top of what our team has done. I'm very encouraged about where, uh, schools, nonprofits, and the church sit right now as we head toward 21. Yeah. What would you, there was a lot there, but one of the the questions that I have coming out of that is search is kind of resumed and you're doing a few more Zoom interviews and virtual meetings than perhaps you did before. Have you, and these are early days, so we're recording this in November of 2020, but we got six months under our belt in this disrupted world. Have you seen who churches or organizations are hiring shift? Like, is it the same positions that you've seen? Or have yeah. you seen, like, I would think, are there more digital positions open? Like, what are the most in-demand positions heading into 2021 that you're seeing? Well, it, a lot has shifted and a lot has changed. And, yeah. and dur- during this time where we couldn't really do search for a while, we went ahead and built some things that we've been meaning to do for a long time that, uh, what do they call it, quadrant two time, you know, that yeah. not, not urgent but super important. And one of those things, we built a sister company to help with uh, sort of staff support roles, uh, because I think what we're going to see. It, so, so here's the big idea that I'd share with listeners right now. I'm telling business leaders, church leaders, school leaders everywhere. 2021 is going to be the year of turnover. Mm. It's going to be, and we can we can unpack that if you want. But I do want like, to unpack that if totally. You, if you think I'm wrong then go ahead and fool yourself and say, well, this pandemic will only last two weeks. You who are listening, you will lose someone next year that you don't see coming. Wow. And I'm not just using that line to play into Carrie's book, which is- No, it's a great line. And thank you, TM. Mm -hmm. You will, you will. I've got a pastor friend who says, every pastor should keep a vomit list. I'm like, what is that? I said, it's a very short list of the two or three staff people that if they walked in at the end of the day and said, can I have 10 minutes to visit with you, which mm, is never good. Yeah. Right. You just reach for the trash can and say, let me throw up first. <laughs> uh, well, here, my prediction is there are going to be a lot of people reaching for the trash can this next year because turnover is coming. Okay. And, tell, let's unpack that. Why, how, wh- what does that look like? Like, like right. explain that. Right. Well, there's, there's a few reasons. And we can get back to uh, this other company as an outflow yeah. of that. But but the, the, the well, for starters, people change jobs. That's just right. the way it is. I mean, every pastor is an interim pastor. Every business leader is an interim business leader. Every superintendent, interim superintendent. And moving around is not a bad thing. Right. Uh, if, you know, if you if you read the Gospels, it's hilarious to hear what Jesus got in trouble with with his own followers. And like the most common complaint I can find where the guys are mad at him is like, dude, can you not sit still? Because it says, no, I got to go from village to village. I've got to keep moving. And they and, lose him. They can't find him. It's they like, lose him. Do you not where stay in one place for 20 minutes? Yeah. Exactly. So that happens. So churn just happens, right? Well, guess what? In 2020, it didn't. Right. So there's latency in the system. There's, there's, a, there's a glut it's, in the system. Like, here's churn as a river, right? And 2020 just put a dam up. And like people, like youth ministry, if, you, if you're a pastor listening, every pastor's had this happen. The, the Monday after Easter, the youth pastor walks in and says, I'm leaving. I want to stay until graduation, until we sing Friends or Friends Forever or whatever the new version of that is. And then I'm out and you're off to the races. Like, well, none of that happened. Everybody's like, I can't leave them now. Right. Or I can't even leave my city now or exactly. so much for that. Yeah. Or, or another factor, I'm not about to inject any extra uncertainty into my life right now. Yeah. So you've got 
people stayed put out of loyalty. Right. You've got people who didn't move because they didn't want to inject uncertainty into a totally uncertain year. Mm -hmm. You've also got a couple other things. You know, interesting, we've had a few re searches that we're doing right now that are a result of uh, in fact, one that will be starting tomorrow for a client where we had placed the worship pastor. He'd stayed five years. He's leaving. And they called us and said, hey, we want you to come do it again. This was great. Well, why is he leaving? Well, this whole pandemic has made them realize they want to live near their family. Yes. And so you've got people like bugging out for lots of different re Like, I want to go be near my family. I didn't leave when I should have. Think about this. Have you ever had anybody on your staff, this happens in business or church, where you give them a sabbatical, right? And they go take sabbatical, or maybe you've heard of a friend that had a sabbatical. They come back from sabbatical. Within a year, they're gone from their job. Yep. Almost. What? There must be a percentage behind that because that is that is like really high. It happens well, all the time. Businesses are smarter than churches. They put golden handcuffs. If we're giving you the sabbatical, you're staying this long or you owe us money. Correct. Churches haven't gotten that shrewd yet. But but why is that? Well, it's not a bad thing. You know, we're creatures of habit. We get into a, a rut of doing things the same way all the time. Sabbaticals get us out of the rut. And we're able to look around and we're able to go to the mountain and be with the Lord and and hear a fresh word or understand that, life is short and we want to get on with it. You know, I 2020 has been the longest sabbatical hmm. ever. Now I know there are pastors right now, leaders right now saying, what a sabbatical for me? I've been working my tail off. Yeah, but not in your normal routine. Yep. This has pulled everyone out of their normal routine for, you say, five months. I've, it's been a while and, and it'll probably be a while. Yeah. People I, are, I think people are looking at summer 2021 before there's any semblance. Now there's talk of vaccine. Is that going to happen? But but one of the stories that has happened here, I've not tracked this story as closely in the U.S. You're Houston-based, I'm Toronto-based. But um, there's been a geographic redistribution. So I live an hour north of Toronto. And like housing sure. prices here are through the roof because people sure. are going, I don't live, need to live downtown in a condo when, right. when I can have a 60-foot lot or a half acre here for less money I'm going to move up here. And so you see New York, like I had Scott Harrison on the podcast earlier this year. He left Tribeca and went into rural Pennsylvania. And you see that as some of the tech companies uh, decentralize. So is that going to be part of it too, uh, where Holy. people are just like, yeah, we want to go live in the mountains. We don't have to live on the coast anymore. Totally agree. I, yeah. You know, we're doing some uh, search work right now in Park City, Utah, and you can't get somebody in a home there. Like there aren't homes because wow. it's close enough to a good airport, but not in the middle of all the mess. And mm. it, you know, we're seeing it in Rye, New York, and in Greenwich, Connecticut, all the places that were where Don and Betty Draper would have lived, right? But then, then everybody millennial went into Tribeca or to Chelsea or someplace cool in New York, and now they're headed back out. So I, we could go with six or seven more really critical reasons, but I promise you, 21 is going to be the year of turnover. Yeah, you're and right. so this year we've been preparing for that. There's going to be a storm surge. I mean, hey, here's another factor. I cannot tell you how many guys and gals, but guys predominantly, who were thinking, you know, sometime in the next five years, I'm going to talk about succession. Well, guess what? COVID accelerated. I don't want to reconstruct this, right? Like, well, you know what? Or I just didn't sign up for this and yeah. they really need a digital native and I'm not, yeah. you know, and it, and it's time to speed this up and get the next person in. That can, so there are just so many reasons why we foresee 21 as a year where there's going to be a lot of turnover and some of it's going to be really painful. I mean, you know, imagine your very best person walking in in the middle of COVID and saying, William, I know we've been together nine years, but I want to start my own marketing company. Yeah, mm -hmm. that happened. Happened to me. <laughs> and and I, it's Holly, who you know well, and I a do. lot of listeners yeah. probably do. And she's going to kill it. She's going to do a great job. And I'm cheering her on and so glad for the time we had with but her. That but that was your vomit bucket moment, right? Like, Holly's it was, great. It was. She even brought it up when she called me. She said, so, you know that vomit thing you talk about? I'm like, yeah, okay, I get it. I'm triggering so, it. But she said nothing but great things to say about her. But I mm. think the sitting still and all the disruption was a real catalyst in her heart for now's the time to get, if I'm, 
let's go ahead and do it. And uh, I just, if you're not getting ready for turnover, then you're going to be in for some surprises in the next year. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's almost as, and at some point, it's not going to happen soon, but at some point, the external disruption is going to normalize. That's right. But then that will fuel a whole bunch of internal disruption where That's people right. go, now I have permission to move, now I have permission. And on the whole succession thing, you know, it's interesting because I'm on year five of a five-year plan succession where I'm off church staff at the end of 2020. But part of me, literally, as I'm wrapping up, as we record this interview, I'm like, I know this was all premeditated and we worked on this and pre-planned and the plan's gone beautifully. But I'm like, yeah, it is a weird time to leave. And yet I was thinking if I was still the founding pastor at 55, in the lead pastor seat, I'd be thinking, am I really going to do this for the next five years? Like, maybe, maybe I will, maybe I won't. So it, it yeah. just raises questions that um, normal situations don't. Um, back to that question about like um, an increase in jobs. Like, do you find more organizations you serve, churches and not-for-profits and educational facilities? Are they looking for tech people? Are they looking for online yeah. social media yeah. people? Yeah, what are they well, looking for? You and I have had a friendly debate throughout this whole thing. I, I just it is a bit it, of a debate. Yeah, it's 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 great. I mean, you know, love it. But I am convinced in person will not go away. I do think. Oh it's yeah, a book and I agree with that. Uh, I, yeah, I, I I kid people all the time. I was talking to the Houston Chronicle yesterday, our newspaper, and they were asking about in person versus not, and why. And I say, hey, look, Christmas is coming. Um, we really believe that Jesus came to Earth in person for a reason. Mm. And, and we're told in, in the Bible that that was the fullness of time, right? So if this were the fullness of time, Jesus would have just zoomed it in. Mm. But there's something about in person that really matters. Now, what's different? Well, the in-person person has to also be digitally native. Yeah. I mean, like the preacher has to be able to preach to a camera and to a room. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, the, the, the pastor, why are people going to come back in person? It's not going to be because, because of our sermons. Forget right. that. Yeah. Content is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be because they want to see friends and they want to be around people so that the, there's a need for digital natives that's coming, but there's also a need. Nobody's talking about this yet. There's a real need. I, I don't know if you're familiar with the old, uh, uh, there's a threefold office of Christ in the Reformed tradition and, and the Acts prophet, 29. Prophet, priest, guys, king. Prophet, priest, and king. Yep. And a lot of people talk about pastors in that role, like the prophetic visionary gift, the, the kingly run the organization gift, and the priestly take care of people gift. There's a huge surge coming in a need for people with a priestly gift. Yeah. Because the other two are going to go out. You're going to be able to outsource a lot of running of things that used to not be able to be outsourced. Uh, the prophetic, I mean, yeah, it'd be great if you could preach well, but people can YouTube anything now and they know it. So like the ability to really care for people and to hyper contextualize your ministry around the the postal code you're in, not just mm. the, the area of the country, like that's going to be key. So, so a couple different fronts, tech positions. Yes. Yeah. And, and like, think about education for a minute in the United States, there's been a pretty, uh, a pretty raging debate. Like in seminary, I went to Princeton. Mm. It's still three years residential only. You got to go to the ivory tower. You got to live there, which you know, the average age of a seminarian now is like 35. So yeah. does that make sense to pick up a family? And and along comes Liberty that has done an amazing job with a lot of pure online you know, degrees. Well, which one is right? And they've been fighting with each other forever. Well, guess what? Now they both have to be both. And the, yeah. and the Princeton guys can no longer just say Ivory Tower. They have to be able to do both in, in the in the sec, in the undergraduate world. Harvard's always said, well, we're Harvard and we're Ivy League and University of Phoenix is hilarious. They have a football stadium named after them and they don't have a football team. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, you know, they, they're totally virtual. Now, people running the schools and seminaries have to be able to think both ways. So you see people like Al Mohler at Southern Seminary doing an amazing job because he's been beating the drum of digital forever and residential. Hmm. It's It's like... It's like churches and schools and nonprofits are looking for dual citizens. 
Mm. It's not an either or. It's a can you be digitally native and still be so here in person and in the flesh? Yeah. And I, I, that, that may not have gotten to the question that you No, wanted, it's a great I, question. And, you know, on the on the priestly thing, the other place I have heard that, um, I did a two and a half hour interview with Gordon McDonald, which was unbelievable. Isn't that he the was, best? What's that? Isn't he the best? He is the best. And one of his insights at Turning 80, The View from 80, was that we need more priests and fewer preachers. And we just spent like 10 minutes on it, but that would be worth looking at that because there is like, I always think nobody can out local the local church, right? Like you shouldn't be able like, yeah, maybe I can't compete with the best communicators in the world right now, but I got people around me that those communicators are not going to come and visit. So nobody should be able to out local the local church. So I see that on the other hand, everybody you want to reach is online. And so it's that hybrid world, that digital world. And I agree with you, you know, when, when, uh, this isn't a Church Trends episode, but one of the things I think is in-person isn't going away. It just won't always be in the facility. That maybe you're going to be gathering people in your homes and the church will equip you for that or well, in the community. And, he, and you know, the old, the old saying, Billy Graham said, the way I prepare for a message is I sit down at a table with a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in another. Mm. I, I, listen to me, Pastor. That's gold. Mm-hmm. Sit down with a Bible in your hand and not a newspaper your most local news. I, I've got a dear friend who's a pastor here in town who's been worried since about April. Like, no one's ever going to come back to our church. Well, mm-hmm. why? Well, because they found they can listen to Steve Furtick now, and they can listen to Matt Chandler. And why would they come listen to me? And I've just said, let's call him John. I've said, John, you know what you have that none of them have? You have a call to your local parish. Mm-hmm. So the local parish priest, the local parish, you know, parson, the, like that's going to be so key. And if you think about it, it's been coming. I mean, we used to have giant malls and then it went to strip malls and now it's local farm to market tables. Well, the same thing's going to happen with talent. It's like, can you speak to here now in this small moment of our smallest part of the world? I I, I just see it being a, a huge deal and not just the the preaching but but the showing up, like paying the old school rent of actually doing hospital visits whenever we're allowed to do that. I, mm. I, I was listening to Tim Keller, who, I mean, if there is one author that we will still read in 100 years, if Jesus doesn't come back before then, like he's our guy. He's our I C.S. Know. Lewis. I mean, he's, he feeds me every time I listen to him. He, he actually taught me preaching at Reform Seminary, preaching to the postmodern world. It was That's a great awesome. class. And, and he was telling a story of going back to his church that he served in Virginia before he moved to New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, he wasn't there. I mean, he hadn't been there in 30 years and they had him back and, you know, all these people showed up and they were asked to share a memory of something that is still in their heart of Tim's time there. And he said it was just one of the nicest things anyone's ever done for him. And it was amazing to hear the stories. And as he heard the stories, he realized, you know, no one has said a word about my preaching. <laughs> like, so I, I just think that old school stuff is what people are going to be looking for in their talent in the coming years and digitally native at the same time makes for a whole new, makes for a whole new kind of support staff. That's why we started this sister company, Christian teams. I mean, in the U S before the pandemic, most estimates that I read said about 10% of Protestant churches were streaming their services weekly online. Yeah. Now, about 10% of Protestant churches in the U.S. are not. Correct. So, you, I mean, that's a massive move, right? So, like, having this guy from student ministries that's in 10th grade as a reliable source for getting things streaming, that just doesn't happen. Every- <laughs> yeah. so, they, so like, so, so these support staff roles that are not executive level, they're, they're going to be huge. And there's going to be a lot of turnover in those too. So we we're like, okay, we're going to have to help if nothing else on the tech and the online streaming, which is not an executive search role. I mean, it's mm. probably a $40,000 role, so we built a whole new company and a whole new system to try and help that. That's, and that's, that's Christian that's, Teams. Yeah. That's christianteams.com. I know that sounds like a commercial. It is to some extent, but but it is an answer to your question of what are we seeing coming out of this 
that's going to be a new reality. And uh, we, I, I think turnover in general, but not just at the top level, also at this support level. And, and if the top is the head of an organization, mm-hmm. uh, the support staff is the spine and, and you can't get by without it. Yeah, I, I'm curious, you know, and, and we do see things a little bit differently, which is one of the things that makes our friendship so much fun and interesting and so many common interests, cycling and big green egg and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot. One of the last things I did when I was lead pastor at Conexus was lead the building um, project. And then one of my first things in my founding teaching role was we launched online in 2016. And we had a good online presence, but like most churches, it was like, uh, and other duties when it came to the service programming person. It's like, yeah, just make sure that whole like website and the stream right. happens and the YouTube thing gets built and all that. So it was good. You know, we would have hundreds or thousands of views, but not not what we have today. And so we were kind of ready when the pandemic hit because it was, okay, we can't meet in person, but we do have this investment in gear. And yeah, we needed some upgrades, but it was a pretty easy switch. But I'm thinking... And then, you know, these days I run a, a virtual company and have for five years, you know, in, in the podcast and the communications company. But um, I'm thinking, you know, from a staffing perspective, I wouldn't be surprised if you see a lot of churches, like I'm looking for a percentage of what you think um, growing, thriving churches will be pumping into digital. In other words, rather than the Oh. And other duties as maybe a signed line in your creative guys profile or the student pastor's profile. Could you see 20% of church staffing going into uh, online support, 40, 50? Like any any yeah. thoughts on that? Where, where do you think that might land in a few years? I'd love to give you the quotable number that you can tweet and make lovely. I don't, I don't know the number. Yeah. Um, it'll be a bajillion times more than it is now there. Yeah. That's not there. Yeah. You can tweet that. It was a bajillion, a bajillion, <laughs> a bajillion times. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I'm already seeing it even in larger churches that were already ready like yours. Mm. Um, instead of getting asked to do a worship pastor or a production person, like a, a Nancy yeah. beach used to be at Willow. Like now it's like, no, actually the person above them now is the communication director. The worship pastor is now going to report to, and I've said this for years, the chief communications officer is the, is the growing edge of the C-suite in nonprofits, schools, churches, you name it. That, that communication, because if we've learned anything through this pandemic, you got to communicate and over-communicate and over-communicate, and you got to do it through so many different channels. So I'm already seeing that. So that's toward a bajillion. Yeah. And then I'm seeing uh, churches like my mother's church, and she she doesn't like it when I refer to her. I'm from North Carolina. I'm from Western North Carolina, and really a beautiful, lovely part of the town. In case my mother's listening, in case my mother's listening, it's wonderful setting, um, but it's pretty deep in the woods. Gotcha. And uh, yeah. it, you know, it's 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 near where they film Deliverance. So, <laughs> so gotcha. no lie. Uh, it, it, great people, good culture. Sorry, mom, but you know, it, it is what it is. And so she's got a brand new pastor who started like in January. Poor guy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Day one. <laughs> I've had a meltdown. Our, Here's your I've job had him description. On our podcast twice now. He's he's wonderful, but man, he just walked into a mess. And I've just said all, so many times this year, if John had come to his board of elders and said, "I've got a brilliant idea." Why don't we stream all of our services online every week from now on? Mm. They would have laughed him out of the room. Yep. They would have said, forget it. And when you ask him what he did with the pen, well, that's what we did. Well, how'd you do it? Well, my wife has a camera and my kids held the mic. Like it was like, like it is so duct tape paper clips right now. And now churches are waking up saying, okay, this is no, this is not going away. Like even when life is normal, this is not going away, whether the digital serves the in-person or the other way around, they're both going to be there. It's like our friend Craig Grishel says, I'm putting all my eggs in both baskets. Yes. Yeah. We've had that conversation and he's like, we're going hundred percent on digital and hundred percent on in-person. And exactly, exactly. And, and, and I mean, resources like Life Church, of course you can do that, you know, which is great. I think that's amazing. But like, I can almost, can you see a world? Cause I'm, I'm thinking about this, like, there was sort of the lead pastor who was also the lead communicator and now the communication thing because it's so complicated with multiple inboxes and streams and social. You have a communication person. 
but I can almost see digital arts being over worship arts or creative arts, you know, where that, that digital thing where the weekend experience becomes an expression of your ministry, but it isn't yep. the ministry. Do, do you see it differently? Do you see it the same totally. way? No, absolutely the same way. In okay. a large church like yours, yeah. uh, or or your former church, or whenever this airs. Oh, we're not leaving. We just, I'm just <laughs> okay. not getting paid anymore. So you know. Well, how that Carrie, works. here's the news. They're they're going to see you as former. Sorry. Yeah, I know. It's succession. I know. One of my mentors has said, "Listen," and they forget you pretty fast. Like, yes, he's right. Yes, he's right. Yes, it's okay. <laughs> And its place knows it no more. Isn't that what we're told about? <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, on a on a large church scale like Conexus, I think you're going to see the executive team change drastically. Yeah. I think the worship pastor being in the room, maybe because you don't want to cut them out, but there'll be a new ad. It'll be the IT director. And it'll be the chief communications officer on a scale of my mother's church where they have a couple hundred people on, a, which is still a big church in the U S but sure. a couple hundred people on the weekend. Uh, you're going to see, you might not see a full time tech person. Right. You might see that $40,000 hire. But what I think you will see is when we add that associate pastor, who really is other duties is necessary. One of the lead indicators of core competency is going to be digitally native. Can they oversee the outsourced labor that, that we have and make sure that that all these high schoolers we're paying or or one offs that we're contracting to are actually following consistent to our belief system and our messaging and our so it's just going to hit every church everywhere it'll manifest itself differently based on size of staff and and such but yeah totally agree with you yeah and i'm thinking about that even at the church and then where where you know I, i'm we still go there it's still our church it's been a great great relationship but i'm thinking of this on my team too so i tend to work with leaders who are decades younger than me and there is a digital native component to that do you think that some of the church staff, because most, you know, Barna's stats, your stats, I saw it in your latest edition of Next, your succession book, the average pastor is 57-ish. So I am still younger than the average pastor, but I'm not a digital native. I have a long pre-digital memory. I remember what it's like to be a teenager and not have a phone or have to get up and change the channels rather than have a remote. Like I remember all that stuff. Um, and I think the church probably skews a little bit older in staff. I have always hired younger and I find that even if your job isn't digital, it's just not hard for them. And do you think that we will end up with a younger staff moving forward just because of the digital native um, component yeah. to it? Well, one, one great hope I have for this, and I, I am uh, chronically looking for silver linings in the middle of a very dark <laughs> yeah, yeah, You're an optimist, yeah. So, you know, I mean, this glass is going to stay half full no matter how much I drink out of it. But I, I, one of my great hopes and beliefs is, you know, the church has been, uh, everybody, what's the famous line? And we, we have a diversity practice, and we keep saying the church is one, the, the most segregated place in America is 11, 11 a.m. On, on Sunday, yeah. Right. I think yeah. Dr. King might have been the first person to say it, but it's not just race. It's it's demographic, too. It's age. Truth. And I'd like to think that, you know, the skinny jean people and the still wear a coat and tie people will actually be forced to have to coexist a little bit more uh, because of pandemic. I mean, I don't know how to do this, you know, cross mentor me or make this work. All I know is a legal pad. Help it be digital. And the digital people are going to be craving more permanence than they had before 2020. So I'm, I'm hopeful that there'll be some uh, uh, more commingling of generations in churches. Yeah. Yeah. No, that would be a that would be a good thing. And and I would just say to leaders like older Gen X or Boomers. And I mean, I've got the iPhone 12 and the whole deal. So it's not like I'm I'm and you too, William. You know, you're not you you like have all the latest gear and that kind of thing. But there's a difference when you started using it when you're 10 than when you started using it when you're 30. There's just, there's a wiring, there's an innate mindset. We're going to go a lot harder on video in 2021. And I'm like, there, my team is telling me, so we're going to create a channel and we're going to do this and you're going to create a show. And I'm like, what does that involve? And they're like, don't even worry about it. Just get in front of the camera, film something, and we'll take care of it. And I think you'll see a lot more of that in church. Let's talk about right. succession a little bit. This is... Sure. Something I've been really passionate about. It's why I went early rather than later. I, I stepped out at 50, um, which a, a lot of people were like, you know, wow, that's early. That's young. Glad I did it. Uh, I think it was the right move for the church, the right move for me. 
Um, are we running into a place where that is going to be even more of a crisis moving forward? Or do you see that situation getting better? What's your take on succession in the church? And I would say for business leaders too, I think I, I think this is actual statistics from like Harvard studies, but like 95%, 95% of all businesses don't really have a meaningful succession plan. Like it's not like businesses have done this better systematically than churches. This is a human right. problem. Right. Well, there's there's a whole lot there to unpack, Carrie. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think when I sat down with Warren Bird six, six and a half years ago to frame out a book on pastoral succession, after my mother called me saying, you're going to do what? I mean, she thought she was going to have to buy all 20 copies of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, my whole goal in writing that book was to say, hey, let's let's change this from a dirty conversation we can't have mm -hmm. to one that we can actually, let's move it from the parking lot to the boardroom. Yeah. Like let's actually, and that's happening. So there is a conversation happening now. That's it. That is so encouraging to me. I, I've been asked to come into some rooms that I would never have been asked to come into before to say, how are we going to talk about succession? And people, you know, there's a saying in the Catholic church, the only sick Pope is a dead Pope. Uh, you know, like, we just don't talk about transition like we're not going to do that. And, uh, you know, n here we are after the book came out. There's a pastoral succession with a living pope in Rome. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So the conversation's happening. COVID has accelerated it. And I, where I see this taking root now, the largest companies in the U.S., almost always have to have a succession plan. There's a, there's actually yes. congressional it's acts mandated. for publicly traded companies that you must do this. But the reality is most of American businesses are not corporate. The, They're you not know, publicly, publicly traded. traded. They're like, you They're know, small, small five, six figure, small seven yeah. figure businesses that yeah. are privately and, and owned. I'll, and I'll tell you what we're focusing on so much right now is how do you do succession in a family business? Mm. Because that's where most businesses are. Yeah. And, you know, what does that actually look like? And, and I'll tell you what, within parts of the church, it's the same thing. Yes. Uh, particularly my friends that are in the, the more spirit-filled or charismatic, like it's just almost a given that it's kind of a family business and it's going to go from the father to the son. Well, you know, the chance of a business going from one generation to the next or a church or a school or what have you, very, very slim that it works. You get to third generation, it's like 10%. You get to fifth generation, uh, like Smuckers is a fifth generation family owned company or family run company. It's publicly traded now. It, there's no research. The only other company that is out there is Nordstrom. And so, so like it doesn't matter where you are. There's a need for this conversation to get real and to study what does this look like. COVID, I think, has accelerated some people's plans about succession, uh, whether it's I'm not digitally native or life's too short, I want to do something else, or I've been putting this off and, okay, let's go ahead and do it. You know, it, there's a, a, or the world is changing. It's not going back to normal. And I didn't sign up for this. There's, there's an acceleration that's happened with succession. Uh, it's, it's, God has such a sense of humor. Uh, we did an updated and expanded version of our book. It's called Next Pastoral Succession That Works. Yeah, it's hefty, uh, man. It's weighty. Like it's a it's a real book. Like yeah, well, yeah, lots like of research. Legit. Yeah, well, and uh, I think we did uh, 500 case studies, 200 in depth the first round, and then went through five or six printings. I mean, this is not like a uh, a book you'd write. This is a soup. They call it a micro niche book, mm. right? But it blew through every expectation for sales. And so they said, "Would you come back and do another version of this with some new research?" So we put 150 new pages of research in there. And uh, what, what we're finding is the conversation's happening, it's going to happen quicker, and it's going to be more urgent than ever before. Mm -hmm. so, some of that, not to go too long with an answer, some of that is because there will be a talent shortage. And that, that has nothing to do, I did not just call young pastors untalented. That's not, okay? So here's what I mean. Uh, let's, let's do a chart, okay? Lots of available candidates no available candidates, right? Lots, none. Let's talk about age going this way. Um, baby boomers, millennials, okay? There are lots of baby boomers that are about to retire. 
there are not many people that are 35 to 55 to take over. Mm -hmm. There are lots of millennials that are under 35, ready to work. But uh, most churches are not going to hand a senior pastorate over to somebody under 35. They're just not going to do it. So whether it's a church or business or a nonprofit or a school, I, you know, you're probably, if you're looking at a succession where we're talking about retirement, you're probably looking at getting in a knife fight with five of your friends over who gets the 40 year old. Mm. I mean, that's just, that, that is the way it's going to go. Now, the, the, the other piece that I would, I would say we wrote to two people when we wrote the book. One is the average mega church pastor is like 61 or two right now in the U S so it's, it's a little bit older and that's primary audience. Like, okay, this is on the horizon. Really interesting. We're starting to get, uh, organizations hire us for a 10 year succession consultation. Wow. We're going to talk about this now because Carrie is turning 45 and he's going to be done when he's 50, 10 year conversation. The second audience we were writing to is the pastor who's 30, who may only stay at his place eight, 10 years. I mean, career change, you know, this studying millennials and Gen Z, like staying in one spot long enough to get the gold watch or whatever churches give out. I think it's just not happening anymore. So it's not just a retirement conversation. You know, it's, it's a, a legacy conversation, no matter what stage of your career you're in. Wow. And um, I'd love to know, because I feel like this is a question, you know, as a pastor, uh, I, I always get asked, if God is so good, why is there suffering? And I feel like um, you could have just preached your best 40 minute message on that ever. And someone would greet you at the door and go, well, that was great. But yeah, honestly, William, if God is so good, why is there suffering? Right? It's like the inexhaustible question. So one of the questions that I do have that feels inexhaustible is why do so, because I talk to a lot of young leaders like you do, and it's like, it is hard to have the conversation. This guy is holding on. He's been phoning it in for five years or 10 years. Why do so many leaders, not saying all, but why do so many leaders hang on for so long, William? Oh, man, if I knew the answer to that, I'd write a book about it, Gary. <laughs> I got a, I got a, uh, a couple of hypotheses or guesses. Yeah. Uh, one is, um, you know, we're, we're pretty far removed from this illustration, so a lot of people won't understand it, but I, I call this hanging on too long thing, the Brett Favre syndrome. Oh, so you yeah. fall football in the U S Brett Favre, one of the most decorated quarterbacks ever. He stayed too long yeah. and he kept bouncing from team to team. Two seasons and, too long. Oh yeah. And you go, why is that? Well, okay. Whatever God put in Brett Favre that allowed him to stand in the pocket while giant men are running at him that want to tear his head off and stand there and make decisions and believe in himself and believe he could do it and zip the ball down the field and lead a team while all that's going on. That's amazing. I mean, who has that kind of gifting? The flip side to that, there's, you know, every weakness is just a shadow side of your greatest strength. Mm-hmm. And and the 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 shadow side of that strength is the voice that whispers in Brett's ear saying you can do it one more year. Yeah. So all right, what's the number one fear in the world that humans have? It's public speaking, mm-hmm. like over and over and over. And Jerry Seinfeld uh, is the one who said, you know, <laughs> people would rather be the subject of a funeral than the speaker at the funeral. <laughs> <laughs> so like, <laughs> so. What is it that God puts in a woman or a man that allows them not just to publicly speak, but to do it every week and not just to do a speech every week, but to say, here's what the creator of the universe says about your life. I mean, like, what is that that God puts in that person? Well, I can tell you what the shadow side is. The shadow side is the the part that says, you you could stay one more year. And And I had a friend, Carrie, who the church I pastored here in Houston had a whole lot of corporate leaders. And I remember one, one guy came in my office one day, his name was Doug and he was a COO of a very large company. And he was considering moving to a CEO role of another company. And he wanted my advice. I'm like, I'm 31, 32. What do you, why do you want? but I thought I knew everything. So it was fine. And, um, uh, I said, what are you concerned about? And he said, William, have you never heard the old saying, 
the first day you're the CEO is the last day you hear the truth. Mm. And I'm still wrapping my mind around that. And I still have to remind myself every day, my staff might tell me I'm doing a great job, but they're not telling me the truth. Because <laughs> you can hire them. You can fire them. <laughs> you, can, you hold all the power. Yeah, They might even think they're telling me the truth, but they're not. So, Pastor, you did so good this Sunday. Mm-hmm. Man, the church is doing well. And you can hear that and not even realize people are not telling you the truth. I think it's why succession for the priesthood is the only time retirement's mentioned in the Bible, and it's mandated. It's yeah. got to happen. Yeah. Uh, do you think some of it um, is financial as well, that I just need to work because they opted out of Social Security? And like, I got to, I, listen, I get it, but William, I just need five more years, man, then I can retire. Yeah. What would you say to yeah. that leader? Well, I'd say you're not alone. You're not alone at all. And I have worked with some of the largest, most successful churches in the country. And you'd be shocked how close, uh, how closely the pastor lives hand to mouth. Right. Despite all and, stereotypes. And I mean, Carrie, we could spend hours unpacking why that that's not pastors or bad managers. Mm-hmm. There's, I mean, there's just a lot of reasons underneath that. Okay. But it's a reality. So you're not alone if that's where you are. Uh, secondly, if you're honest with your church, they'll fix it. I promise you they will. I, I, I can't tell you the number of times in the last three years that I've sat down with the board and I'm like, you know, to make this right, you're going to need to pay carry this on an accelerated basis so that we can get the succession done. And you know what those business leaders look at me and say? They say, absolutely. And I, I, and I have don't res- hesitate, right? Well, I have, re- and it's not because they love you. I mean, maybe they love you. That's <laughs> no, great. They just want you out. <laughs> they no, know no, what's no, best. No, 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 that's not it. No, 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 no. The most expensive thing you can do in a succession is screw it up. Mm. I mean, that's like it. You look at the churches that have just gone shoom, that, that were the biggest church and they have bad succession and they lose revenue and they lose vision and they lose people and they lose and they lose, 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 and they lose time and momentum. And, you know, I have it in my hip pocket to say to the board, I know it sounds like a lot of money to pay, you know, in deferred compensation, but it's less expensive than the, I don't even have to finish the sentence. The business women and men in the in the room say it's less expensive than this going bad. Yeah. And that's not a, that's not a retirement issue. That's a money issue. And that's what I, when leaders ask me, I'm like, that's, that's just something you handle financially. And the pastor is probably relieved, um, along the way. Say, Carrie, if you're listening, if you're listening to this and you're a 35 year old pastor, y'all are doing budgets right now, probably, Mm -hmm. even if you don't say y'all, wherever you're listening. And, uh, I, I would encourage you when they say, is there anything we could do for you, uh, that we're not doing now? Ask them to give you an expense account expressly for financial planning. Mm -hmm. Now, church might come back and say, oh, we have three financial planners in the church that would look. No, 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 no. Pastors don't want to share all that. with. But if you're a board member and you're listening, you want to help your head of school, you want to help your CEO of a nonprofit, you want to help your, your pastor, provide for them whatever it would cost to have good financial planning early on so that they can lock into a good plan. Because, I mean, Ben Franklin's right. The greatest secret in the world is compound interest. Mm -hmm. Get started early and you're fine. And churches would fall all over themselves to spend the three to $5,000 a year that it would take to have really good financial planning and save them the more expensive conversation later. Mm. How much of it is identity? How much of it is all my best days are behind me? Yeah. Well, well, so this, that's, that's, I hear two very different things when you say that, um, having been a pastor yeah. and, and then a former pastor and, and rather suddenly, um, I was, I was shocked how empty I felt when people didn't need me or call me or want me to be important in their life. I, it, it consumes you. It consumes you. And I'm not like my dad wasn't a preacher. My granddad wasn't a preacher. It's not like this is the family thing and it's gone. And so like, I was just a, I was kind of the weird one. When it, when, when I told my family I was going to go into ministry, my grandmother said, we were at a big family dinner and she said, oh good. Now we've got one to get us all in. So like, 
<laughs> <It's> awesome, <laughs> Grandma. <laughs> right, exactly. So, you know, this is not like the family business that I gave up, but the, I don't know of another job on the planet, except maybe being like a head of state mm. that consumes your identity. It's where you do your life. It's where you do your spiritual life. It's where you do your relationships. It's where your kids grow up. It's where your kids get married. It's where you bury your friends. And when you walk away, you walk away from a lot. Yeah. And oh, by the way, they don't call you. Well, you think it's because of who you are, but it it's turned not. out to be because of what you do no, to a large I extent. I don't know if you, I mean, you're the interviewer here, not me. I don't know if you've experienced this, but I, I, I had a lot of leaders in this church I was in, and one of them was a guy, uh, Lloyd Benson. He was a senator here. Oh, in the yeah, US. yeah, I know that name. Yep. Yeah, he ran for vice president uh, mm -hmm. when Dukakis ran against Bush and and Bush had Dan Quayle and and his famous line was, I knew Jack Kennedy and you're no Jack Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And like, so it, it, anyway, um, Lloyd was in our church and I, he uh, uh, had a stroke and was not able to communicate much. But uh, his wife asked me to be the chaplain of the U.S. Senate for a day. It's an honorary thing that you go do. And so I went to do it. And, and my host was a guy named Tom Daschle who used to be a Senate majority leader and from one of the Dakotas, I don't even remember which one, but he, he, the November after I was there, he lost reelection just out of the blue. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know how you lose an election in the Dakotas. You just call everyone there, right? <laughs> There's only, but anyway, he lost and I called Miss Benson and I said, Miss Benson, what, what's the best way to write him a note saying so sorry? She said, I'll just give you his home phone number. I said, I'm not calling Senator Daschle at home. And she said, oh, William, you have no idea how little the phone rings once you're not in office. Wow. Like, that's what's going to happen, Pastor. Hmm. And uh, it, it is part of the reason people wait too long. I'd say the three biggest reasons succession have failed up till now is – in in maybe no particular order, is uh, finances, mm. a, a lack of a calling to something else. So you're giving up your whole identity and you don't have anything to backfill with. You know, the, the priests in the Old Testament retired from carrying stuff around the desert, but they had new priestly duties, right? So, and then the third is uh, the whole family's uprooted. Like you're, mm. you got five family members on staff and they're not ready to give up or the, the spouse is not ready to give up that role. And Man, those three things, if you could focus on those three things and, and be ready in those three areas, you're going to be ahead of 95% of the whole field. Yeah, I would just vouch for that. Honestly, as someone who went a little bit early, everything you're saying completely resonates. And the mentors who have coached me, I've, I got a lot of coaching and counseling in the early days and of the succession. But even over the last year, you know, I started to feel it in my heart and in my gut, like, oh, this is the end. Here it comes. And it was a bit emotional for a week or two and I called a couple of friends and and they just said, they forget you fast and don't screw this up. It's gone really, really well. Like don't, don't sabotage it. Don't wreck it. And it's been going great. But yeah, that whole idea of, um, you know, you give your whole life to something and then you realize, oh, that was the position. Some of it was definitely the heart and we got in some nice notes, but, um, and then what am I going to do with my days? Right. And so I have the privilege of being able to do this and I love it. And I feel like it's a call on the whole deal. Um, but I think a lot of us who are made to work, uh, and I feel that way, like this is kind of my retirement. I love doing this and I enjoy it and I get up with a spring in my step, but, um, it's a bigger part of your identity. And I think I'll be disentangling that for a while to come. So I just want to say, I hear about that. 15 years later, I still am. Are I, you? How yeah, does that show up? How does that show up at this point, William? You ask me a question, I take 20 minutes to answer. It could have been a sermon. Uh, you know, um, I, I do get the chance to pastor to pastors. Yeah. So there's yeah. a, the, the priestly part still gets to come out. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd say, Carrie, you know, the hardest, I think the hardest decision Adrian and I have had our entire marriage has been where are we going to go to church? Because oh, yeah. I turn into a snob. I'm not going to go to my former church in the Presbyterian world. That just doesn't work. But, you know, so I got, it's not like where you are, where it makes total sense for you to be at Connections. Yeah, but it's weird when you're not like in on the meetings anymore and you're not up on stage and you're not like, it's weird. And you're sitting there going, this doesn't feel like my spot. 
But it Adrian is. told me. Adrian told me when we uh, landed at the church that we're at and we love. She said she knew it was getting better because I wasn't sitting rewriting the sermon for the pastor while he was giving it. <laughs> yes, I may have done that from time to time. Mm-hmm. No, it's hard. I mean, I think turn into a snob. Why don't they do it this way? Why don't they? They're missing that. They're, it, it, yeah, that's how it shows up now. But I, I, I don't know how I'm, Andy says it. Andy always says it so well, Andy Stanley. But he's like, you know, it kind of wrecks you because you're um, listening at church rather than listening to the preacher. You're listening uh, at the sermon rather than listening to the sermon. And it is very hard to suspend like curiosity. Why did he do the intro that way? Like, I really want to know. Or it's like, well, I wouldn't have done it. Why didn't you start with a story? And then you get into that critical space in your head and you're like, oh, this is not good. Now I, now I need to go to confession somewhere or something. I don't know. See, but, the way that, that was, that's, that's exactly what I was doing. And that's why I just started rewriting the sermon for him. <laughs> just gave me something to do. It's like, uh, you can have like, this for free, okay? <laughs> Normally I would charge, but you can have this for free. Yeah, no, it is, it is a weird disentangling. I think it's some kind of spiritual discipline. Um, how would you know? I, I've, I've done a lot of thinking on this and I'd love to pick your brain, but uh, signs it's time to go. Like there is someone listening to this who goes, but no, William, I have one more season left in me. And then right. there are others who are like, no, I, I get it. I should have been gone four years ago, last year, two years ago, but it's money, it's identity. It's, I don't know how to have the conversation. Um, right. any, any signs that you've looked for in your own life or things you've seen in your work or your research that's like, yeah, that's a good time to go when you see these well, things pop up. I think uh, a couple of the signs that I'm seeing around. So so if you ask the question, uh, we did this through research, when does God usually put his hand on a pastor for growth? Mm. At what age, right? So we took, and this is a very small sample group. There's probably a lar- larger, but churches that had the same pastor for a long period of time that had some modicum of growth over a sustained period of time. So what were the growth rates and how old was the pastor during those growth rates? Mm -hmm. So, you know, just, is there a time? And if you show me a church that's had the same pastor for a while and show me their growth rate, I can show you exactly where the pastor's 40th birthday is because things spike. And, and if you're sitting there saying, I'm 33 and I got to get going, I'm not getting enough done, you're not even to the start line yet. So things like, spike well, at 40. Tell me more. Absolutely. I mean, you know, now there are some outliers. Steve Furtick's gotten quite a bit done before 40. So yeah, yeah, he's done okay. <laughs> he's doing all right, although I think he is now in that power generation. But uh, I think he did cross over the the, the river into the 40s. But, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if it's because in Texas we would say by the time you, when I when I went to First Pres Houston at 31, I I got so much wrong. I didn't know how far I was over my head. Um, and I tell people the one thing I, I really had going for me was I, I knew everything. Mm. Right. At 31, like <laughs> I could identify now. Well, I wouldn't have even been able to identify with it then. But my very favorite Ted Turner quote, I think I've told this to you before. He said, <laughs> If I had a little more humility, I'd be perfect. <laughs> so, and that was 30-year-old William. That was it. And and at by the time you're at 40 in Texas, you'd say, I've gotten knocked off my horse enough now mm. that I know what I don't know. So there's something that happens at 40 that causes growth. Now, show me the same chart. I'll show you where the 40th birthday is. I can also show you another line that's either their 55th or 60th birthday. And what is, what line is that? Where it flattens and starts to decline. Yep. And, and, and maybe it's 65 and there are outliers. Mm-hmm. Ed Young here in town is 83, still taking two steps at a time when he goes up the stairs, mm-hmm. uh, still preaching live. I mean, he's amazing. So there, there are outliers, right? But, but the really unfortunate thing is that unlike the hockey stick at 40, it's not a hockey stick back down at 60. It's, it's just, just a, a flattening and a slow that's, decline. Well, I think you said the words mailing it in. Mm-hmm. And and so, like, I'm turning your question a little bit, but how do you prevent that? Yeah. Well, when you're growing, go ahead and set key indicators. Mm-hmm. Go set key indicators for it. Mm-hmm. Now I know it's time. And don't bail and say, well, you know, people don't come to church as frequently as they used to. So right. our numbers don't blame really the culture. Don't blame right. the culture. Right. I mean, yeah. you can pay attention to those things, but uh, I, 
I would say as I talk to, so I never got to 60 as a pastor. So I'm not like, I don't have, you know, personal experience to bank on, but guys that I talk to, there's 60. I talked to one today, today. Yeah. 62 in great shape, huge church. And he's, he's done. And he said what so many said, he said, I still like preaching. It's all the other crap that's making me so tired. Or another pastor that said, do you know how many board meetings I have till I turn 65? Because I do. (laughs) Like the person who tells you how many days until the retirement, someone who's pensioned, right, or whatever. It's like, yeah, I I have 3,218 days till I'm done. You know, I used to think I was going to be a PhD um, because I didn't want to be a pastor. I wanted a respectable job. I thought pastors had bad hair and asked people for money. <laughs> and uh, I, I grew up around Jim and Tammy Faye Baker was my backyard growing up. So like the PTL club, I, ugh, I'll go be a professor. And then I realized professors only teach students about four hours out of the whole week. And the rest of it is being in the library and reading what got, I hate that kind of, I can't stand sitting still. But w- flip it to the pastorate. Your preaching is only this much of your time. When you start to lose joy in the daily grind of ministry, and I don't mean it got hard because I know it's the hardest job. I've had it. Mm. But when you really start to lose joy and you don't gain any energy from it, and, you know, that's a clear warning sign that it is time to start mailing it in. I would you know? agree with that. I would say in my late 40s, I started to notice, okay, some of the stuff that used to energize me doesn't energize me. And some of the things I used to be excited about don't excite me. And it was too many meetings and too much this. And the part of the job I still liked was preaching. And I went, I think if you extrapolate this seven to 10 years, this is where you end up with that plateau and decline and the phoning it in. And I'm like, I'm going to hand this off. And the year I finished, we had double digit growth and you know, it was, it was great. So you kind of went out on a high, but I, I can totally relate to that. And sometimes like what I'm doing now, I still wake up pretty much delirious every morning that I get to do what I do. So that's a, that's a great feeling, you know? Well, and, and things shift and change. I mean, yeah, you're in a church that's been the same forever and you're just doing a faithful job tending the flock. You're going to have a nicer place in heaven than Carrie and I do. I yeah, promise. Truth. You know, you, you're on the front lines, you're doing the real deal. It does not have to be grow, 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 grow. So, you know, when, when you start getting worn out by the daily grind, that's a good sign. For some people, the ministry grows and your job changes. There are lots of people that when they're 50, they don't want to keep doing the same things and they shouldn't. Their job mm-hmm. should change. And it, it, you don't have to be first in the office, last out or retire. It's not one or the other. You, you right. can find ways to get more done with fewer hours. I, I'm not at all saying once you quit wanting to be a workaholic, which I think most overachievers are in their thirties, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, that's not it. It's, it's more of a, is this draining you more than it's feeding you? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, if you're drained, it's going to show up, it's going to show up in your leadership. It's going to show up in realizing your mission. What do you say? You've got sections in your book on this for, uh, cause there are also leaders listening who are like, great. I just hope the senior pastor, or my boss listens to this and he probably won't, or she probably won't. How do I have the conversation with somebody who doesn't want to have the conversation, William? Yeah, that's really, really hard. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't, if you're a subordinate staff, I don't know that you get to. Ah, uh, so it may not be your role. May not be your role. And it's certainly not your role to go talk to the board about it so they can do something about it. Mm. There's a word for that. It's called Absalom. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm serious. Yeah. There, who, who, what king in the Bible should have hung it up sooner than he did? How about Saul, mm. right? Mm-hmm. He should have hung it up. Like he kind of lost the whole deal. What did David do about it? Not mm. much. He refused to lay a hand on God's anointed and God honored that. So I don't want to get all preacher on you, but uh, I would say you tread very lightly into telling your pastor it's time or having someone else tell the pastor it's time. Now, you know, an anonymous. And maybe could that be a time for that leader to kind of realize they've hit a glass ceiling in the organization, whether they want to be the successor or not. And then you evaluate your own options, right? It's like, well, maybe it's time for me to move on. 
it's it's one kingdom with many locations, mm. right? So maybe it's your turn to go from village to village and town to town, yeah. And and let God work it out as God will work it out. Sometimes I've seen it. Sometimes pastors will hire me for succession, and one of two things happens when we get in consultation: either it speeds up or it slows down. It never stays on the same schedule they thought, and sometimes it'll slow down because the pastor hangs on too long. Sometimes the pastor really does hear a word from the Lord as only they have been able to for the history of the church. I need to hang in there. I need to, and it, you look back with hindsight and you're like, wow, how'd they know that? So I just, I, the longer I do this, the more stern I am toward those in the second chair or the third mm-hmm. chair saying, let God sort that out. Pray all you want, but do not sow any seeds of discord or approach the conversation. You can send them a free copy of the book. Maybe you do that. (laughs) Doc Mark, you know, earmark uh, that page. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. exactly. Okay. But Uh, but, but the good news, if you're sitting in that second chair, if you'd asked me the same question 10 years ago, I'd have said, oh, I hate this for you because no one really talks about it. The good news is everyone is talking about it right now. Yeah. Every yeah. peer group of pastors in their 60s, it is, I get called in, I get called in, whether it's the leaders of the Southern Baptist Church, the leaders of the Presbyterian Church, I get called in two years ago to a meeting of the the hundred senior pastors of the hundred largest black churches in the U.S., okay? Not like ethnically diverse. They're like, no, we're black churches. Like, I was the diversity in the room. Like, that's it. And <laughs> I'm like, guys, why are y'all having me in here? Because this is a conversation and it's time to have it. And we don't even know how to. Wow. I want to be really careful with the next question, but um, you raise it in the book and you were very public on your profile and you and I've had some conversations, but you led the Willow Creek search. And I think that was one of those things where, uh, you know, with uh, Bill Hybels, he had tried the succession was 15 years ago. That didn't work. And then all the allegations uh, came forward and uh, resigned in moral failure, et cetera. And the church just kind of fell apart. What did, um, what are some lessons there that can help? And I'm not here to point fingers. I'm not here to blame. I, I don't like to engage in that, but, um, you do have some lessons in the book about that and hundreds of other churches. You talk about the crystal cathedral, you talk about many churches, others have not heard of, but that was something, you know, everybody, including people who don't go to church kind of watch transpire. So anything you can share that would help leaders, um, try to figure out here's something constructive we can take from that. Well, I've got one real clear constructive, but a little backstory first. And that is, uh, you know, I've seen the sausage factory, right. And particularly a lot of it with Willow. And I have so much respect for that church. And I was, I was a pastor, Carrie, I I was in seminary. I thought I was going to go be the PhD and be the professor at school because I wasn't going to be a preacher. And then, you know, I realized that wasn't going to work. I got in a wrestling match with God. I limp and I became a pastor. You know, I lost. And um, I went into ministry and was just kind of doing what I grew up with, was being a Presbyterian pastor of a regular church. And you just kind of take care of people, which is a great calling for a whole lot of people. But I am like a serial entrepreneur. And this was like oil and water. And I I started my D-Man, my doctor of ministry, early at Reform Seminary, and they let me sign up early. And I ended up having dinner with someone at the school that said, sign up today. Well, the only class that was open was a class on, like, small groups or something. I'm like, okay, fine. And I had to go to this church to a conference to take the class. And it was to Willow Creek, and it was to their old, you know, boot camp conference they did years and years ago. And I remember where I was sitting in the Lakeside Auditorium when Bill did that thing that only he can do, where he reached from the stage. I remember what he was wearing because he wore the same thing throughout the 1990s. But I, 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 he reached out from the stage and somehow all the way across that auditorium and tapped me on the chest. And God used that moment to, to have a mini conversion. And it changed my ministry. So, you know, human leaders should always be respected, but we can't can't ever forget they have clay feet, right? So I don't want to 
throw him under the bus or throw the church no, under no, the bus. No, no, no. It's, it's one and, of the most perplexing things, and I've had this discussion many well, times. I would not be where I am today were it not for Bill. So I, you know, and I, I made a point throughout the search of not contacting him one time because I don't want him to have to say, well, William, I don't want me to have to say the word. So stayed out of that. But what, what, what are some lessons? Okay. I wanted to give that backstory so people understand I am so unwilling to throw rocks here. Right. Yeah, yeah. And it's not unwilling to take a stand. Here's, here's the backstory to every one of those succession stories you listed, whether it's Crystal Cathedral or First Baptist Dallas or First Press Hollywood or yeah. Willow Creek or churches you don't even remember, Laodicea, Smyrna, you know, go through the seven that aren't there anymore. No pastor wakes up one morning and says, I think I want to blow up my church. Mm. Not one. But part of the reason I was excited to do the rewrite of the book was I had to get rid of Mars Hill, Seattle. Mm. Uh, I couldn't talk about New Spring in South Carolina anymore in Perry. I couldn't talk, like lots and lots of examples of great list. churches. It's a long it's a list. Long list. It's a long list. And, and some of it is not even these guys' faults. I mean, that's a long podcast we can do another time, but, but nobody wakes up and says, let me wreck my church. Okay. Um, I think the, the other big lesson that I learned from Willow, one of the things they did really well, and, and the jury's going to be out. I mean, it'd be 20 years before we know whether the thing worked or not. Right. Mm. So it's, let's not claim success. Um, they, they do have an amazing pastor in Dave Dummett. We gave them our best consultant to be their exec pastor in Tim Stevens. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, they've got a lot of good going for them. But I, I think that um, one of the coolest things I saw was the elders that stepped down, got replaced by people that have never been elders. And I used to joke and say, it's like I'm, I've got all rookies playing in the Super Bowl trying to pick a pastor. I mean, what? And somebody pointed out to me very wisely, they said, but William, that's how Willow's always worked. Hmm. It was a bunch of kids that didn't know what they were doing. And so now they've got elders that don't know what they're doing and they did a good job. And it's like, maybe a lesson is when you get in this crisis, the place blew up and you didn't know why. Maybe it's why Paul said to one of those churches in Revelation, remember your first loves. Hmm. Like when you find yourself in that heart, just go back to the first things and try and recapture some of that. And, and that might be your guiding light through a really hard time. For pastors that have blown it up, hey, man, I've blown stuff up too. I'm yeah. telling you. I, and I, I just want to clarify. I know you're not saying this, but just to, to uh, clarify. Yeah, maybe it's, you know, in some cases, there are situations where it's not their fault. But if you hurt people and harm other people, that is your responsibility. Totally. I know you agree with that. I just wanted to say that. I, just to, I hurt people. Hmm. I caused harm. It yeah. was my fault. Yeah. I will own it. Yeah. But that doesn't mean God's done with you. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. And again, to quote Gordon McDonald, I, I had a friend text me who was dealing with a moral failure that will not make the headlines. Like, you know, it's just this happens every day, right? It's just some of the big churches make the headlines and a lot of the other churches don't. And uh, it was an associate position at the staff. And he said, what is the good content out here? Because I think there's two things. It's either you know, somebody says they're sorry, they want to get back into ministry the day after they resign and like, I'm back and I'm starting a church or I'm doing this. And I'm like, oh, I don't think that's it. Or you banish them to the wilderness to die forever. Um, and nobody ever hears of them or speaks of them again and their life is functionally over and there's no reconciliation. I don't think that's it either. But Gordon McDonald wrote Ordering Your Private World. But then, of course, he had, uh, he had an affair, which many people would say was out of character for him. And um, he was deeply remorseful um, and then wrote a book called or Rebuilding Your Broken World. And that didn't sell nearly as many copies as Ordering Your Private World. Both are great books. But I think it's part three of that book, and we'll link to it in the show notes, has a process for restoration that I think just should get front news coverage in the church these days because you put yourself under the authority of other people you forfeit your rights. You go back when they say you're ready, not when you say you're ready. And um, there's a whole restoration process in there. And I found it just so redemptive. And in and, and the few cases where that's been followed, um, it has been a beautiful and harmonious restoration for all involved and true reconciliation. 
Um, and ironically, I might be wrong about this. I'm fairly certain I'm right. But ironically, one of the people Gordon submitted to for guidance about when to come back was Bill. You might be right. That I don't know. But I believe he was on that group. But mm -hmm. and why do I bring that up? Not to defend him, but just to say, you know, if you screwed up, yeah, there's a price to pay. Right. right. But it doesn't mean it's over. I mean, it just yeah. doesn't mean it's over. That's and I, I, you know, I used to, we started this, Carrie, we, part of what we get hired to do when we're finding a leader is making sure that we're finding people who are who they say they are, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you're not getting a charlatan or somebody who's, you know, telling fibs or looks great online, but it's not so good in person, right? And uh, so you ask these questions in an interview, you say that you, you want to find out if there's skeletons in the closet, right? And so... You try and find cute ways of saying it. And I don't do this anymore, but one of the dumbest ways I've ever asked this question is I used to say, so, so Carrie, are there any moral failures that we need to go ahead and talk about now rather than find out about later? Do you have any moral failures in your life? And I, I was asking this question and it's probably, gosh, probably 10, 11 years ago now. And this kid, I was interviewing for a youth pastor position. He was probably 24, 25. Hey, are there any moral failures in your life? And he just looked at me and he said, William, I am a moral failure. <laughs> you know, I got schooled. Great I mean, answer. like, so, you know, this is why Jesus came here. <laughs> Doesn't mean you can go back to your church. Doesn't mean you should go plant something right down the road. But Jesus came here to seek and save the lost. And that's not just once and for all. And I, I just encourage you, you probably didn't set out to blow up your church. And you may not be able to go back there. But it doesn't mean that God's done with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in my case, you know, my uh, marriage stayed intact and, um, you know, there was no scandal. I just kind of imploded when I burned out and I thought it was over. I just, I worked too hard. I worked too long. And it's not like I was perfect. I had stuff God was working on in my life, but nothing that would get me, you know, fired or anything like that. And um, I thought it was over and I had no idea that it was a refining for what was ahead. And wow. um, I think that is a good word. And I know there's a lot of tired, a lot of discouraged leaders. Uh, there's a great book we'll link into the show notes. I'm trying to remember who it was from, but it was about um, 10 reasons that people have moral failure. We'll find it. We'll link it to it in the show notes. I'm trying to remember uh, who it was. Um and I read it and it was like things like I stayed too long or uh, I was uh, out of season or I wasn't wasn't with the people who could hold me accountable or whatever. But there were some really unlikely ones as well. We'll link to that in the show notes. So if you find yourself there, uh, we, we want to help. And um, well, that, that gets back to carry the whole how do you know it's time to go? A lot of guys that that really and I say guys because we're the ones that mess up more than the women most oh, yeah. of the time. And yes, that was chauvinistic. And sorry, guys, we're the ones that screw no, up. We, we mess it so, up a lot. You know, um, leading on empty doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Leading I, on empty doesn't work. I think what got me was his research, and he researched this, was like if you're six months over when you should have made a shift, whether that's a job change or a calling change or an organization change, he says you get bored and you start getting restless. And that's when the not very healthy behavior starts. So anyway, it's, it's a really interesting, we'll find the book. I, I will discover it. William covered so much. Anything else you want to share before we, uh, no, no, you know, round? I just say, I just say, uh, you know, Willow's had a hard time. We talked about them. Um, they're going to have choppy water before it gets better probably, yeah. but man, being in the middle of that and watching how Jesus is moving in that church, I, you know, there are still people who love Jesus. I thought Dave was a great choice for that. And he well, brought in some of his team to, uh, I think he brought his assistant and, uh, Tim. Well, that's why we, we, we actually talked to Dave because we wanted to get Haley there. Yeah. She's uh, sharp. <laughs> she's really well, sharp. Dave's, Dave's a consolation prize to the church. <laughs> Haley's the winner. Um, yeah, no, I, I just say that to say, you know, you might not be a Willow Creek. You might be, well, we only had a hundred people before COVID and I don't even know if people are going to come back. You know, Jesus is working in his church yeah. and, and we go into some of the biggest train wrecks in the whole kingdom and Jesus is still there. I mm. promise you he's working in your church no matter what it feels like this year. Hmm. Hey, that's a great place to close this round. Love having you on. Love our conversations. 
Thanks for helping so many leaders. So tell us about the book and then a website where people can find you. Well, the book that everybody needs to read is a book about burnout, but it doesn't come out till next year. So we'll talk about that again later. Okay. Uh, I think, I think that's something that I want to hear what you have to say about. Uh, The book that we released in March of 2020, it's a fantastic time to release a book, is uh, Next Pastoral Succession That Works. And this is an updated and expanded version. Um, It's not in bright yellow, so your staff won't notice if you buy it. We changed the color of the jacket uh, to a nice soothing blue. Uh, But there's there's a whole lot more research in there and uh, more than we can unpack here about what works and what doesn't work when it comes to pastoral transitions. All right. Well, William, thank you so much. Yes, always good to be with you, Kerry. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerrynewhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerrynewhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before.